Greetings from LA, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journeys, our discussions, our discoveries, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2024. And that brings us to a title which already exists, in fact, in the Criterion Collection Physical Media Catalog at spine number 834. But this time this year, upon the occasion of January 2024, the Criterion Collection has re-released this title, uh, but this time uh, employing the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray format for purposes of this uh, this uh, alternative buying option. So we have a film that currently exists in the Criterion Collection physical media catalog, but this time in a in an alternative buying option here. And I'm speaking of the work which is described as being from the year 1984, and the name of the director is Joel Cohen, and producer Ethan Cohen, and written by Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen. And the name of the work is... Blood Simple. This is the work, the amazing, amazing work from Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen, the Cohen brothers. Uh, described as being from 1984, and uh, it is in many ways a, a groundbreaking hallmark film in the context of the Coen Brothers filmography, it being uh, their first feature film, and uh, uh, it has been a very uh, brilliant and uh, wonderfully vivacious uh, road since. But uh, Blood Simple, this film, Blood Simple, is uh, a truly uh, breathtaking and roller coaster ride in many ways. And it still remains uh, that way, uh, even uh, many years after its initial release uh, in 1984. And a lot of that has to do with the artistic collaborations, both behind the camera and in front of the camera. So in terms of the collaborations uh, behind the camera, we have, for example, director of photography, Barry Sonnenfeld, a brilliant uh, a musical score by Carter Burwell. And then we have, uh, in terms of the great, great cast in this, uh, uh, people like John Getz and uh, Dan Hedaya and uh, M. Emmett Walsh and Francis Dorman and others. Oh, this is such a thoroughly entertaining film. It's scary. It's inventive. It it has a, a kind of wholesomeness uh, that is very apropos, a type of slice of life Americana. Uh, the film takes place in uh, in the setting of Texas, which which itself is a very key character. I mean, it's set up at the very outset of the film, a kind of uh, pre-titles uh, monologue of sorts uh, that introduces the world, uh, both in terms of the exterior lush uh, vistas that are part of the milieu, the environment, uh, but also the inner interior workings that are uh, very much paralleling. Uh, the uh, inner workings of the characters in this uh, display. And when we were speaking about this film, uh, Blood Simple, I mean, part of the great appeal of this film and indeed the Coen Brothers films overall is how the characters are rendered. And so uh, we have this great package of, of, uh, of a film, a thriller. It's oftentimes described as a film noir or neo-noir oftentimes is used. Uh, there is great uh, moments of suspense, Hitchcockian moments, which we'll also get into, Alfred Hitchcock homages, as it were, as well as a really wonderful, uh, a twisty human drama where things are not always what they appear to be, or perhaps to put it more, more directly, characters think one way, but what they are thinking about other characters is a complete misconception. And we as viewers have all the details, or we think we have all the details as to what's going on, so uh, uh, we feel like on the one hand we might be, uh, we might know more than what a character knows at a given moment, but at the same time we don't know because uh, the unknown still remains the unknown and that, that grand expanse of, uh, of, of a cinematic suspense and tension is I think what makes this film, Blood Simple, so great and so pioneering and so entertaining and so engaging and so frightening and suspenseful and horrifying. 
uh, to this very day. And so this is uh, the great, great film from the Coen brothers, uh, Blood Simple. So before I get uh, any further, let me point out that uh, the Criterion Collection has re-released this film, Blood Simple, uh, and at, at the, you know, on the occasion of this year, January, or on the occasion of 2024, specifically January 2024, it's a re-release because it already exists in the Criterion Collection, uh, current uh, physical media catalog. at spy number 834, and it was released around 2016 uh, on this Blu-ray. And so what we have here is a re-release of this, uh, the same spine number, but this time utilizing uh, a 4K UHD disc plus the Blu-ray disc. So it have, we have two discs here, which is uh, uh, befitting the, uh, the current trend of Criterion releases and Criterion's handling of the 4K format. So we'll have a lot of, of things that we had already seen in the 2016 release. We'll have a lot that is carried over to this current re-release, including aspects of the presentation and supplements. So we'll talk about those details a little bit later in this video. But uh, before we get to that, let us talk very briefly, uh, or touch upon briefly, the story or plot structure of Blood Simple. And I think if we were to do that, we can focus in on this uh, this setting, almost a slightly desolate setting, of uh, of Texas, and we are uh, we are encountering uh, our core key characters, uh, Ray and Abby, and uh, we understand too uh, that they are uh, having uh, a relationship uh, and also a a kind of affair, and this is to the chagrin of Marty. Uh, and so, uh, so we already have the the love triangle set up, uh, portrayed by our main characters, as portrayed by uh, Dan Hedaya and Francis McDormand and John Getz. And so we have this love triangle that goes very sour, very quickly, and turns deadly, uh, especially when we understand that Marty, uh, the, uh, the 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 Marty character, is not f just feeling himself to be quite wronged in the situation, but he goes to extreme measures to uh, try to confront uh, the Ray character and the Abby character, and perhaps uh, he feels defeated both physically and emotionally. Thus, he takes even further extreme measures in order to uh, essentially uh, get back uh, the people uh, that he feels have wronged him and that have betrayed him. And so that leads to a very... A frightening appearance of uh, the detective character, and this is the M. Emmett Walsh character. And once this character is uh, set into motion, already we've had a set of, of character and plot hijinks uh, that have uh, showcased a type of bravura and chaos. Uh, again, the Marty character trying to get back at the Ray, uh, at Ray and or Abby, maybe uh, trying and and uh, doing it in a wonderfully spectacularly chaotic. Uh, Cohen Brothers esque way that's filled with a lot of camera movement and uh, great uh, uh, zigzagged breaststrokes that uh, convey a sense of comedy and, and comedic hijinks on the one hand and utter horror and fright and sheer terror on the other uh, that also uh, maybe depend on happenstance, circumstance, luck chance, little details that may fall in that, again, may suggest either some kind of div divine intervention or perhaps uh, just the, the sheer uh, cruelty of randomness in the world. Uh, and so this also leads to great details uh, that the Coen brothers uh, and Barry Sonnenfeld's uh, camera really pick up, focusing in on, on little details like uh, the bug zapper and flies. And uh, that also allows for the, the sound uh, palette to also uh, showcase a type of carefree desolation on the one hand, but also the uh, sheer weirdness and oddness of random chance. Uh, that, again, could be divine intervention or could be just a sense of, of wry, dry, and witty, uh, cruel, uh, maybe uh, luck or bad luck, or good luck as the case may be. And so we have the wonderful intimate characters portrayed uh, that also showcase, again, the little details, uh, fish on a table, lighters, uh, as I say, flies and bug zappers, but also the characters themselves. And so 
uh, Ray and Abby uh, and Marty. But these aren't the only main characters because, as I say, we have another character that is introduced. Uh, when things uh, are threatening to uh, kick into high gear, they really kick into high gear. Uh, and uh, the private detective character, uh, who is portrayed by M. Emmett Walsh in this wonderfully uh, garish suit and hat, uh, like something out of a a uh, a type of comedy western, at least as appearances go, and so uh, some uh, a figure that is very very one of a kind, very memorable, uh, uh, almost uh, uh, exploding out of that uh, that uh, uh, fashion sense there, and that feeling of explosion and tension, I think, is very very befitting as well because. Uh, what might seem to be somewhat garish and uh, uh, almost slovenly buffoonish on the exterior uh, is maybe even a very carefully crafted uh, mask of the viciousness and the uh, the clever, almost Machiavellian uh, uh, planning and double cross that is uh, going to take place once this character, the M. Emmett Walsh character, enters the picture. And once we have this, it was a plot that already had a lot of high stakes and a lot of emotion riding on it with the love uh, triangle that was established between John Gitt's character, Francis McGorm and Dan Hedaya. But once we have M. Emmett Walsh's detective character entering the picture, uh, things are going into full-blown chaos where things will not be where, will not uh, be what they seem. Uh, characters might think they know something, but what they perceive what they know is something completely uh, uh, antithetical to the truth. Things might be hidden from them, or they might um, uh, misinterpret situations that are completely uh, beyond what is going on. So maybe uh, one character might be thinking one thing about another character, but it's completely opposite. Or yet that character is thinking something else about a completely different character. But we as uh, audience members know, or we think we know, what's going on because we have a, a, a wider picture. But but that's one of the great things about the Coen Brothers film, Blood Simple. We as viewers think we might know uh, on the one hand. And indeed we might say, oh yeah, we actually know what's going on between these two characters. Uh, and this character here doesn't know. Thus, their lack of knowledge makes them think something completely different about this situation, etc. So that kind of misunderstanding and 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 hijinks is uh, is on display, which is almost like a, a screwball comedy of errors, in a manner of speaking. But we, as view, as audience members, know the big picture. We think we know the big picture on the one hand, but when we have a lot of this misunderstanding and things come to a head, the explosive nature uh, of the confrontation scenes lead to even further uh, mishap and uh, twists and turns that are completely unexpected. Thus, we as viewers know or we think we know, but at the same time, there's a wide range of, of vista in this uh, Coen Brothers blood simple landscape where we are on edge and we don't know what's going to happen. Again, we think we know and we have information, but that's one of the great things about this. We are still kept on edge. And when things come to a head, things turn so sharply and so suddenly and so viciously uh, thus to make for very unnerving viewing indeed. And what's so great about uh, that type of viewing is because of the unknown factor and because the tension is ratcheted up, things are layered in this film such that we start from seemingly minuscule, almost mundane day-to-day -day details, but those day-to-day -day details just uh, build and build and build and build until we reach a point where it's built to such an extreme that there is no further way forward except to topple over into this type of chaotic soupy mess and gooey and bloody mess. And, and that's what we get. And, and the way it's scattered about, the way that it's uh, haphazardly shot about, uh, uh, we're not sure what we're in for uh, until we reach the, the dark and, and cruel and cold and bloody finale uh, that is uh, in store for us in this and indeed perhaps other films by the Coen Brothers, but certainly here uh, in this film, Blood Simple. So uh, we are in for quite a thrill ride indeed. But uh, I mentioned earlier about the notion of a screwball comedy hijinks aspect, the idea that characters seem to be 
uh, misunderstanding situations uh, because of information that is withheld from them at a given point in time. So they might misinterpret what a motivation of a character is, and their thinking might be completely different to what the actual situation is. So I think it's very much apropos of a, of a screwball comedy, almost like a Howard Hawks screwball comedy. And also this has a feel of a horror film as well as a film noir film, uh, the idea of doomed characters in a desolate setting, um, and uh, maybe uh, having to do with uh, the sort of the underbelly of uh, sexual jealousy and uh, money and murder and uh, betrayal and uh, uh, a type of uh, a rivalry uh, that reaches ahead, uh, guns and violence. And so there's a, a very deep-rooted film noir element, uh, and I think the camera and the color palette and the way that the darkness uh, of the exteriors and the way that the skyline uh, uh, portrays a kind of desolation of the uh, of the of the of the, uh, uh, the environment around them uh, really augments this aspect. So it's a screwball comedy. It's a it's a dark film noir film. There are also really grisly elements here uh, that I think are akin to like a horror film as well. There's some real horror film aspects to it uh, that are like uh, uh, even to the point of uh, uh, maybe uh, a type of parallel or, or uh, uh, interesting way that the camera suggests almost a slasher film aspect to this. And this also is suggestive too of something that we'll talk about uh, when when you get into the supplements and the uh, behind the scenes uh, comments about how Joel and Ethan Cohen were first for trying to uh, get this film made, and one of the things they knew they could try to do is is to to um, uh, their work with or their inspiration from. Uh, other uh, exploitation films or horror films of the moment. And one of the films that they cite, or one of the filmmakers that they cite, is Sam Raimi in the film The Evil Dead. Uh, and there are some really interesting parallels in terms of the camera movements in that film, uh, and also the way that camera and Barry Sonnenfeld's camera and uh, Cohen's uh, uh, camera work here are really uh, parallel that, as well as the content of the film as well, uh, having these real scary, frightening moments, that, that the way that light shines through uh, bullet holes and knives and and knives and and uh, and uh, the 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 idea of the of the killer uh, stalking aspect. It's really quite scary. So there's a horror film aspect to this as well, um, as well as to a kind of confrontational aspect uh, that I think the Texas uh, landscape also uh, portrays uh, the desolate nature of the exteriors, confrontations between characters, which is very much akin to a, like a western film as well. So. Already, we have so many genres, so many touchstones, touch points that are being, I think, juggled in this wonderful, uh, uh, chaotic uh, soup of a, of, a, of, a, of a sort of cinematic marvel that is Blood Simple, as well as within that, as I mentioned, uh, maybe uh, uh, hallback, um, callbacks or homages to Howard Hawks. There are some interesting uh, uh, tones and uh, uh, suggestions of Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, etc. So uh, this is a wonderful example too of how the Coen brothers really are able to juggle so many great genres together, but uh, it doesn't feel derivative. It always feels still very fresh and very inventive. And I think in a film like Blood Simple 2, and it, this is also a great uh, point about this, I think what also helps it very strongly is how uh, how grounded this film is. How should I put it? It, it never feels I mean, when it's layering, and it does go to certain extremes, it always does it from a, a almost day-to-day -day, uh, starting point, and then builds and builds and builds and builds from there. When I think what I really like about that, too, is how it, it uh, I think, the independent film aspect of this, the low-budget uh, filmmaking aspect of this, really, I think, helps that building, that layering. Uh, we, as viewers, watch this, or I, as a viewer, watch this, and I, I can identify aspects of, the, say, the camera work that uh, I think feel very, uh, very novel and uh, very uh, useful, in a, for a lack of a better phrase. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, the uh, the independent filmmaking aspect of the film. But then, as it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, uh, I suddenly find myself realizing that I've been swept up. Uh, in uh, all these elements that are, uh, I think, layered and piled on to the point of, uh, of a type of um, uh, high-pressure cooker situation. So I really love that uh, way that this film invites me in, but then before I know it, I, I, uh, I suddenly realize that I have been 
uh, totally swept up uh, in a type of, of uh, invisible roller coaster ride that I think is uh, very befitting a Coen Brothers film like Bloodsum. So I really appreciate that, while also appreciating its very, uh, very wonderfully independent uh, filmmaking spirited roots. Uh, which are also acknowledged by uh, uh, Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen and, and Barry Sonnenfeld and others in the, some of the sub and Francis McDormand, etc., and M. Emmett Walsh and others in the uh, supplements, which we'll again talk about momentarily. So it is a, a wonderful, marvelous mix of all these, and the sheer, I think, scope and drive uh, that is on display uh, with the storytelling and, and just the way it, it twists and turns. But the twists and turns, I must say, again, I think are very, uh, are very welcoming in that they aren't so extreme as to uh, break the kind of suspension of disbelief. They feel just extreme enough uh, from the previous point. And then we reach that point and then we go to the next turn, which is just extreme enough. And it goes to the next point and it takes a certain sudden right turn, but it's not too sudden and it's not too, you know what I mean? So I think it, it knows how to balance itself very well, but still understand how should they put it the balance of extremities which i think is so great it doesn't break that sense of uh, suspension of disbelief uh but in fact i think it encourages it and and it knows when to apply its beats of of sudden chaos while also allowing us to take a step back and to breathe and to consume and to almost contemplate. So I love that balance uh, between almost the quiet contemplative mood moments uh, and the sheer horrific and sudden bursts of violence on the other. And that kind of balance is a, a wonderful, a wonderful type of cinematic uh, pacing genius that uh, is already exemplified in this film, Blood Simple. Uh, in a, a genius uh, way, so uh, and it's always inviting, and it makes it always very uh, inviting and warm on the one hand, but then also quite sudden and shocking and thrilling on the other. So uh, it goes to the great pacing and the great storytelling craft and technique that is already on display from Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and then uh, go to going to the performances as well. Uh, I mentioned. Uh, the wonderful outlandish nature of uh, M. Emmett Walsh and his character, one of the standout characters of this film, and then also, I think, uh, I dare say, uh, the Coen Brothers uh, filmmaking canon, one of the great, great characters. Uh, but that's not all, because the, the wonderful performances of the, uh, say, uh, uh, John Getz and uh, Francis McDormand, they have this type of uh, and I, I and Francis McDormand uh, acknowledges this in uh, one of the interviews that's part of the Criterion Supplements here, how it's her face almost registers a sense of confusion uh, throughout uh, most of the performance, and I think that's so befitting. It's it's almost like uh, the character is designed in a way to react to all the chaos that's around them, and I think that's true also for the John Getz character and his performance, uh, Ray and Abby, are great performances uh, because they are reacting. They are meant to be reacting characters, but they are also active characters. And the way that they move, almost in, in a type of, of uh, unknowing chessboard-like fashion, they're making moves on a chessboard, almost maybe without knowing it, but they know that they need to move. So they are both active and reactive at the same time, which I really like. And the way they react, too, uh, could be in a way that is totally misinterpreting the situation or something that might be, at the end of the day, uh, uh, moves or actions that could potentially save their lives in this really chaotic life or death situation that the Coen Brothers uh, story is throwing at them. So I love that type of action and reaction aspect to their characterizations. And, and John Getz and, and Francis McDormand and, and Dan Hedda as well, uh, Marty, uh, one of the great, uh, one of the great uh, uh, types of uh, uh, underdog villains, uh, uh, roguish uh, villain loser character, uh, but done in a way that is uh, so understandable and so likable and unlikable at the same time uh, that makes for, I think, very uh, a topsy-turvy uh, Coen Brothers storytelling indeed. Uh, it's really wonderful. And uh, again, the performances across the board um, and the characters here, Marty, uh, um, Abby, and Ray, are just uh, 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 through and through uh, absolutely brilliant and, and wonderfully sustained. So, uh, And again, this is something that we will see uh, in Coen Brothers films going forward, that being the great sustained performances across the board. And, and uh, if Blood Simple is any indication coming 
this early in their filmography. For those who are on a Coen Brothers journey to explore their other films, I think you're going to be in for real treats indeed. Uh, not just the way that the film looks and sounds and the storytelling, but also uh, their performances. And Blood Simple is filled with uh, across the board, brilliant, brilliant performances. And I should point out too, it's something that we'll talk about in the in the supplements further. Is just the look and feel and the sound. I mean, the Carter Burwell score is is uh, melancholic. It's moody. It's sustained. Uh, there's a wonderful piano motif that's at play. A really uh, wonderfully uh, po uh, poetic and melodic. And then the inventive camera work of uh, the Coen Brothers and Barry Sonnenfeld, their collaboration here, uh, the way that the camera almost moves over things uh, like a ghost or uh, is uh, very contemplative with uh, the way that darkness and shadow and space uh, is framing characters uh, in the distance, in the foreground, and, and the color palette, almost like a neon blue or the neon lights of the interior of a bar on the one hand, or maybe uh, the, uh, the expanse uh, and desolate vista of the exterior on the other, and how darkness and, and light, uh, um, or sorry, how light and uh, brightness simply give way to these uh, vicious uh, bursts of darkness, which in turn are even uh, punctuated by sudden, almost blinding light, uh, light shining through a bullet hole even, uh, and that also focus on the mundane and the very nitty-gritty details, whether it's, as I mentioned before, fish on a desk or a lighter or maybe little droplets of water or something like that. I, these details are captured and it, it, that gives us a sense of the expanse of the universe, the macro aspect and the micro aspect, and I love that about the camera work here. It captures so much as well as the rich detail at the same time. And so uh, much like uh, capturing so many elements of genre and much like capturing so many elements of the of the grotesque and outrageous and also the quiet and intimate, we have such a great eclectic mix, uh, again, in the hands of Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen here uh, at the center of this film, which is ultimately, too, ultimately such an entertaining, horrific romp uh, that is, I think, uh, so inviting and so telling and so, uh, so, in uh, so invigorating and so thrilling uh, upon rewatch and rewatch and rewatch, uh, thanks to great releases like this Criterion release. Uh, this is the film which is Blood Simple. The Criterion Collection has re-released this film, Blood Simple, uh, on the occasion of this year, 2024. And uh, but this time, of course, it is employing the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray uh, uh, aspect of this. So as we mentioned before, this had been released or this has been released already on an earlier 2016 release on Blu-ray on the same spy number, same cover art design, as you can see, uh, and, uh, and, and the like. But uh, this time with this release, this 2024 release or re-release, uh, we have uh, two discs, the 4K UHD disc and the Blu-ray disc. And so uh, with respect to the 4K UHD disc, uh, or I should say too, uh, which, excuse me, uh, let me take a step back. The 4K UHD disc is what I have in the player. Uh, the menu is one of these menus where we have clips, uh, actual moving clips from the film itself in a type of uh, edited montage. And so just for the sake of, of not offending the YouTube copyright gods, I've just uh, let me uh, uh, very gently block out uh, the screen here uh, uh, on this YouTube video, so I hope you can forgive me, but uh, again, uh, the 4K UHD disc, when you put it in, will have certain montage uh, edited clips from the film, uh, and then the, f the 4K UHD disc has the film and the chapters and subtitle options there. Uh, the Blu-ray disc is where you're going to get the supplements, so not on the 4K disc, so uh, we'll talk about the the Blu-ray and the fork, I'm sorry, we'll talk about the Blu-ray and the supplements found on the Blu-ray disc a little bit later. But uh, before we get to that, with respect to the transfer, uh, the notes, the liner notes in the uh, fold-out here indicate, and I quote, Blood Simple is presented in its original aspect ratio of 1.85 to 1. This new digital master was created in 4K resolution from the 35mm original camera negative. Uh, the 5.1 surround audio mix was supervised by sound editor uh, uh, Skip Leavesay. Additional restoration was performed by the Criterion Collection. Uh, the feature is presented in Dolby Vision HDR, high dynamic range on the 4K Ultra HD disc, and high definition SDR, standard dynamic range, on the Blu-ray. Uh, and so, yes, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the 
the presentation on the 4K disc and then on the Blu-ray disc. Uh, and to my eyes and ears, uh, this presentation that I see on the 4K disc, and I've seen it now a number of times, uh, looks and feels like it is the same or relying upon the same uh, transfer uh, presentation materials that were found in the 2016 release. So uh, to my understanding, we're not speaking about any um, any new uh, restoration of this film uh, for purposes of this 2024 release. So, uh, but uh, again, uh, I, when I see the 2016 uh, presentation of this, and now and when I see it again, for, but using the 4K or putting the 4K disc in the player, uh, I'm reminded of of how I think vivid. Uh, this film uh, has been looking in the hands of Criterion and sounding in the hands of Criterion. Uh, and uh, I think there's a, a great uh, sense of, of shadow and light that is uh, very, I think, uh, well uh, contrasted and delineated in a way that uh, is very befitting uh, sensibility of this film as a, as a type of neo-noir or film noir aesthetic. Uh, things are in shadow and things are allowed to be bathed in light, but also uh, not betraying uh, the, uh, the sensibilities of darkness and uh, the depth of shadow that I think are also very important here in this film. And so you'll have scenes that are in darkness, but then are suddenly bathed in, in, in bright light uh, in a corner of, of the screen or sometimes even uh, uh, right smack dab in the center of the screen uh, even when you have a, a, a sequence that's meant to take place in the darkness of night so it's that type of extremity of uh, and playfulness of light and shadow that uh, I think is well preserved or at least it's very enhanced uh, when I watch this film uh, again from uh, my experiences with the 2016 release from Criterion and now uh, with that same or similar type of feeling and vibe when I put in the 4k disc in the player uh, and then watch the blu-ray again as well so uh, that is to my uh, my understanding that at least from my personal experience I think uh, the Blu-ray was already very strong and is very strong. Uh, and so if you have the Blu-ray already uh, and uh, you're happy with it, then ch then maybe you don't need to go for the 4K plus Blu-ray uh, option, purchasing option from Criterion. Because as I say, you're getting uh, a same or, or a similar experience. Uh, and then the, the 4K UHD disc is going to be applying the uh, the uh, HD technology as well. So there is a certain HD type of enhancement, I'm, I'm sure, uh, which I think is very befitting, uh, especially those who are preferring the uh, 4K UHD physical media uh, home viewing option. Uh, so if you're one of those people, then of course the 4K option or this new option I think is, is good to go and, and a really wonderful one. But uh, if you have the, the Blu-ray, uh, already and you're happy with it then uh, I think you'll continue to be happy with that uh, because it was already very strong to begin with but once again if you are in the neighborhood for this film and you are uh, liking the 4k options from Criterion thus far then this is your opportunity to uh, to get this because uh, it is still continuing on what I think is a really great uh, Criterion uh, experience uh, for purposes of uh, the Coen Brothers film Blood Simple. So uh, I think you're, uh, it's a win-win situation either way, in my view. And so now what I've done is I've put in the Blu-ray disc into the player now. Uh, and so uh, be the reason why I put in the Blu-ray disc is because uh, we can, of course, watch the film on the Blu-ray disc as well. It's still made available on the Blu-ray disc as well as the earlier 4K UHD disc. So whatever your option is in terms of the viewing home media experience, uh, you have either option for those who opt for this two-disc uh, re-release of Blood Simple. Uh, but if you're interested also in watching the supplements, then uh, you're going to have to go to the Blu-ray disc. The supplements aren't included on the 4K disc, but only on the Blu-ray disc. And so uh, that's why I have the Blu-ray in the player. Uh, please also note that the Blu-ray menu is once again a, a series of uh, montage edited clips, moving clips from the film. So uh, for purposes of this YouTube video, I've just very gently blocked out uh, the, uh, the screen here, uh, lest I offend the YouTube copyright gods. So I hope you can forgive me, but uh, just note that it is a, a series of moving uh, images from the film. Uh, as part of the uh, Blu-ray menu, as we saw for the 4K disc as well, the 4K disc menu. Uh, but let us turn now to the supplements. As I mentioned before, uh, this had been released by Criterion in 2016 with supplements, and so we're going to get the same carryover from the earlier release 
uh, that we had before, and we're going to get the same carryover stuff in this new current uh, 2024 re-release. Uh, so um, uh, what did we get before, and therefore what are we getting now? So uh, the supplements that had been included but, and are also included now are, uh, first of all, a section which is called Filmmakers, and when I press the button, uh, there is a further sub-menu or sub-sub-menu that takes us to two uh, selections. First up, Shooting Blood Simple. And the menu says, Joel and Ethan Cohen tapped Barry Sonnenfeld to photograph their debut feature, which represented a first for the cinematographer as well, as he had never shot on 35mm before. Uh, 35 millimeter film before, excuse me. In this selected scene discussion filmed in May 2016, the three sat down with uh, telestrators in hand to discuss and illustrate the film's lighting and design and talk about some mistakes they felt they had made along the way. So this is a essentially a scene select commentary with Barry Sonnenfeld and Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen sitting a side by side in a in a studio on a, in front of a table with what's described as telestrators, which I understand are I think uh, the way for them to essentially draw and and draw on the screen. And so what we can see occasionally is moments of a frame of the film that they're talking about, and then sometimes we'll see drawing action. And so they can actually draw and and make arrows and circle parts of the of the screen that they're referring to because it's all of, also about space and about how things are focused or soft focus or lit or soft lit, etc. So well, that's the uh, what I understand is the meaning of the reference to this word telestrator. So, uh, but it's the three of them sitting down essentially and talking about certain scenes as they. Uh, uh, are uh, progressing. So this is totaling about one hour and ten minutes. It's not the entire film that they're talking about, but it is a good chunk of the film. Uh, so uh, in that way, it's a scene select commentary, and they're going in order uh, uh, because they're watching the film and they're going in order. Sometimes they stop, they freeze frame it, sometimes they go back some, because uh, to allow them the opportunity to recollect uh, and uh, give anecdotes about certain situations and scenes. Um, also, uh, uh, they have this really great rapport between and among each other. Uh, they talk about, um, for instance, the the driving scenes early on and how with the car that Ray is driving, the John Getz character is driving, and how in fact it's actually three, two or three separate cars in different shots uh, as well. Uh, and also they talk to about the color palette. Uh, I made reference to a scene that involves a bug zapper and a fly, uh, and how that was also maybe uh, maybe even a happy accident type of way in which sound and lighting design really uh, uh, were permitted to have this quirky atmosphere about it, too, so that was really cool. Um, and uh, they, they talked to about um, uh, Barry Sonnenfeld and how he really gets into it, and he has this uh, tendency of, of feeling nauseous uh, when uh, certain uh, intense moments happen. So uh, they mentioned Bear Sonnenfeld and his tendency to get nauseous on, uh, during shooting, which I thought was a very interesting anecdote. Uh, they also mentioned certain wide shots that I think they very affectionately refer to as quote-unquote high, wide, and stupid uh, and the like. So uh, they have this, I think, really interesting, uh, very casual, um, effacing, self-effacing uh, shorthand uh, between and among each other, which is really, really interesting. Um, and uh, they talk too about uh, their influences of, uh, of uh, uh, independent low-budget filmmaking. As I mentioned, Sam Raimi and The Evil Dead was a really particular influence. It's actually, there's a key camera movement that happens fairly early on in the film involving uh, the Marty and Abby character. Uh, outside of a house and a huge sudden sweep of a camera movement, which is, uh, they talk about how it was shot using essentially a kind of two by four, uh, a very uh, a very independent film style rig that they fashioned, a handmade rig in a manner of speaking, which uh, is very much like a certain moments of filmmaking in uh, Sam Raimi's uh, independent film career. Uh, and uh, uh, there's some interesting interplay between Barry Sonnenfeld and then Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen about how uh, he works with them and how uh, maybe he says, maybe jokingly, but perhaps quite uh, quite accurately again, about how uh, from his perspective, Ethan Cohen tends to want to go wider with the shots and Joel Cohen tends to want to go tighter with the shots, which I thought was an interesting way to distinguish the, the artistic collaboration between the brothers. Uh, and... 
uh, talking too about the performances. Uh, M. Emmett Walsh has mentioned a lot too about uh, working with M. Emmett Walsh, which will come up a little bit later in, in some of the supplements, and, and uh, how he was, I think, very much a type of um, of a um, uh, avuncular, almost curmudgeon, uh, in, uh, in a uh, very affectionate way. So, uh, and M. Emmett Walsh is one of the standouts of this film. Et cetera. So, and they talk too about some really key sequences. There are some grisly uh, killing scenes as well, and they talk about uh, uh, very affectionately, but also in a very self-effacing way, uh, certain, they might regard as mistakes now, but way that maybe things were off focus or, or too softly focused, uh, scenes that were then intercut, maybe they were uh, assembled with different uh, pieces of film, part of the sequence was shot in one part of the country and then another sequence was, or another part of the sequence was shot in another part of the country and they were edited together to seem like it's in the same space and time but in fact they're shot in two different places two different time periods etc um, and I think they point out very affectionately some of the quote-unquote film mistakes uh, and the like but uh, I think it, it's also a testament to uh, the the three of them and their collaboration uh, very maverick very um, uh, very almost uh, uh, um, a uh, uh, how should I put a a, a a no holds barred fearless type of uh, filmmaking, which is uh, again very apropos the independent filmmaking spirit uh, that the budget I think almost commanded, but also their sensibilities uh, also uh, tended towards, which I think is a really great uh, aspect of many. Diff many differing circumstances coming together at once to create almost this perfect storm of a of an artistic collaboration. So this is, I think, as close as one will get to a commentary track on Blood Simple, but uh, that's not, to, I mean, it's a great one. It's a really, really great one. Uh, and it's not a full, complete one, uh, but that, I don't think, takes away from its greatness. I think it's really wonderful. I mean, I like the little way in which their pens on screen interact with the, the screen itself so uh, very very cool indeed so it's nice to get this carried over again uh, this is the shooting blood simple uh, select scene commentary with the three of them in the room talking and sometimes we also get shots of them talking as well so uh, and that's not just the film itself we sometimes cut back to Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen and then Barry Sonnenfeld with the three of them in, in the same frame so that's also very cool indeed to see their reaction and to see them interacting with each other uh, in 2000 2016, which is some years after uh, they were making the film. So it's also a really nice, nice touch indeed. So uh, this is a really great one. So that's the first uh, supplement up here. And again, approximately an hour and 10 minutes. Next, we have Conversation with Dave Eggers, and uh, who's the author uh, and screenwriter and founder of McSweeney's Publishing, sat down with Joel and Ethan Cohen in May 2016 to discuss the director's debut, Blood Simple, from its initial inspiration and their efforts to get its production off the ground uh, through the complicated process of finding a distributor. The experience they reveal remains one of the most exhilarating of their careers. And this interview uh, with uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen is approximately 35 minutes. And this is really cool as well. Uh, again, touching upon a number of the points that they had mentioned uh, with their uh, select scene commentary uh, with Barry Sonnenfeld uh, in the earlier supplement, and but also going into other details as well. So this is really, really cool indeed. Now, talking about making this film in the early 80s and the uh, the environment of the early 80s, uh, again, mentioning of Sam Raimi and the Evil Dead, as well as uh, getting a film, again, with two, at the time, they, they were, uh, were uh, first-time filmmakers. And so uh, it was hard enough to try to make a film uh, off the ground like this and so uh, they were acknowledging how uh, the sort of independent horror film roots and, and environment was really a great way to sort of cultivate this and I thought that was a, a really great and telling moment and so crucial to um, uh, many a career not just the Coen brothers uh, uh, but also many other careers and I love how they acknowledge that in a very affectionate way here so that's very cool um, and uh, talking to about how they're trying to fund this film uh, with the various uh, Minnesota investors and and uh, there's uh, so anecdotes about accidentally hitting a car and and also uh, there's an, an anecdote about a urologist. Uh, it's v uh, very Cohen-esque anecdotes here uh, in that way. Uh, and then also encountering the actors that they were meeting or that they worked with on this film. So 
uh, acknowledging the the uh, uh, the circumstances, how they uh, they met, uh, and how they ended up working with Francis McDormand, uh, and how Holly Hunter uh, had been considered uh, early on as well uh, for the role of Abby, but it ended up uh, being uh, Francis McDormand for, through certain circumstances involving the, uh, the connection between Holly Hunter and Francis McDormand, and of course, as we know, uh, the collaboration uh, between the Cohen brothers and Francis McDormand, and also Joel Cohen and Francis McDormand. Uh, is uh, one of the uh, the key uh, uh, key relationships, uh, both uh, professional and personal, uh, that uh, is part of the Coen Brothers, uh, uh, Francis McDormand uh, cinematic uh, collaboration film experience. So, and it's here in Blood Simple, uh, which they talk a little bit about. They talk to about uh, other performances like John Getz's performance and also uh, M. Emmett Walsh. Uh, for instance, M. Emmett Walsh they had seen in an earlier film. It's a great film called Straight Time. Uh, and so uh, they were thinking about uh, this and, and essentially uh, summoning up the courage to approach M. Emmett Walsh. Uh, uh, very uh, uh, the audacity of their approach is uh, one of the great anecdotes here as well and uh, the fact that Emmett Walsh responded and ended up being in the film that's also a really really cool anecdote and they also mentioned how uh, th it was uh, sometimes intimidating working with him uh, but it was always to at the end of the day to fuel the performance and to fuel the uh, the, uh, the the production here so it's a great working relationship uh, M. Emmett Walsh's character also highlights aspects of, of display and uh, uh, the Texas uh, uh, atmosphere and the ambiance. It was also mentioning here too about how w how and why Joel and Ethan Cohen ended up uh, filming this and setting it in Texas. Uh, there are some uh, reasons behind it, both behind the camera and also in terms of the, s the setting and the story. So uh, those anecdotes are also shared here. Uh, there's some interesting uh, notes here about uh, maybe some uh, some homages, maybe intentional, perhaps uh, 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 through serendipity, uh, homages to say uh, Pulp Fiction uh, and uh, uh, see the uh, kind of um, uh, uh, hard-boiled fiction of. Uh, of uh, 20th century uh, American literature. Uh, Dashiell Hammett is mentioned somewhat, uh, but Jim Thompson also is mentioned too. And so they also acknowledge how uh, they uh, their connection, or perhaps uh, it, it was almost a, a, a happy accident in terms of uh, the, the way in which Blood Symbol could be seen too in, in the kind of vein of Jim Thompson. Although uh, the Coen brothers do acknowledge to how uh, it might also be seen somewhat different from uh, the world of Jim Thompson and his literature. But it's a very interesting um, uh, interesting uh, setup here. Uh, they also mentioned to uh, the work of uh, uh, um, Dan Hedaya and uh, and others here. So uh, a great, great uh, sensibility here. Also, they they are very, I think, self-effacing uh, and very humble and modest about uh, deflecting or almost even resisting uh, interpretations of this film uh, in terms of social commentary. I mean, they are very much acknowledging how at least they say here, they didn't mean for it to be a type of uh, film that could be interpreted in, uh, in the light of sort of social political context. Uh, despite uh, early uh, pre-title sequence monologues uh, re with respect to the Cold War and communism, uh, and especially given the light of uh, this film taking place and also being made in, in uh, early to mid-1980s, um, uh, in many ways uh, one of the heights of the Cold War. Uh, you have uh, something that could be, on the one hand, seen in or through the Cold War lens, but the Coen brothers here, I think, resist that, or at least they say that they resist that, which is also one of the interesting things about the film. Uh, the film can be interpreted through many ways, many, many ways, uh, even ways that might have been beyond the initial intent of the filmmakers themselves, which is, I think, a testament to how great and how malleable this film is. So, uh, as well as uh, the circumstances, uh, I, mean, I mentioned Hitchcock, too, they make a really great uh, and pointed reference to a key Hitchcock film uh, from the 1960s, which is called Torn Curtain, uh, and uh, they make reference to that uh, in the context of the plot point of Blood Simple uh, 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 involving uh, a killing or a death, and so uh, that is also very, uh, very apropos as well. And then they talk a little bit, too, about how... Um, um, how uh, the, the film ended up getting a lot of attention. Uh, it, it, uh, it picked up a lot of steam, especially uh, how it eventually was able to uh, be uh, 
shown at the New York Film Festival, which they indicate was a really, really big deal, uh, especially for a first-time filmmaker. Uh, to have a first-time filmmaker's film be shown at the New York Film Festival was, was a, a rarity indeed. So that was a big deal for them and got them a lot of press and a lot of attention. And they, uh, they reference uh, some of the reviews they got, uh, some very glowing, like a review they mentioned from Janet Maslin. And then others uh, quite uh, maybe dismissive, like a, a review they mentioned of Jay Hoberman. Uh, but uh, uh, they rever uh, they refer to those reviews uh, very affectionately even now. So, um, so uh, very very cool indeed. So, um, uh, and in any event, yes, we have the uh, wonderful uh, discussion here uh, between uh, the brothers uh, in this great interview. So this interview is also available. Uh, it's carried over from the earlier release. It's great to have it again, and approximately thirty five minutes. So please check it out if you can. But that's not all, because then we have um, the uh, actor section, and then the supplements continue with two interviews with uh, two actors, one with Francis McDormand, and this is described as actor Francis McDormand auditioned for Blood Simple on the recommendation of her friend Holly Hunter, and the part of Abby Marty became her first feature role. In this interview recorded for Criterion in June 2016, McDormand offers insights into the Coen brothers' creative process and discuss, discusses the many ways the film changed her life both personally and professionally. So this is very cool indeed. Approximately 25 minutes. Um, and uh, it's so cool to hear uh, uh, Frances McDormand uh, and her her recollections about how she ended up working on this film and there's reference even in these notes to Holly Hunter and, and uh, how Holly Hunter had been considered uh, but circumstances involving what Holly Hunter was involved in at the time uh, prevented her and her schedule from actually being involved here. They, so uh, they ended up uh, through circumstances uh, involving how Holly Hunter and Francis McDormand knew each other. Francis McDormand ended up auditioning and ended up uh, getting the role here of Abby, uh, and how she was also uh, very much this was her uh, her own debut as well. So uh, this she was also uh, very much a newcomer uh, when it came to making a feature film of this stature of this magnitude, at least uh, at the time. Uh, so very much like Joel and Ethan Ethan Cohen here, uh, very much a newcomer uh, in this uh, world of filmmaking. But uh, uh, she makes her her uh, she she leaves her mark. Uh, in terms of her performance, I think very, very memorably, uh, very memorably indeed. Although Frances McDormand herself acknowledges, in, in a very modest, humble, self-effacing way, uh, aspects of the character, uh, maybe that she might regard as somewhat uh, two-dimensional, um, uh, but she doesn't, uh, uh, she doesn't uh, describe it here as a type of negative or knock against the film. Um, but uh, she does acknowledge that maybe uh, there is a bit of a, uh, of a of a flatness to the character. But I think that's also a testament to how she was able to infuse a, a sense of the three dimensionality. Because as I mentioned, or I tried to mention earlier, there's a way in which uh, uh, she is a very passive character that is reacting to things around her. But she's also very active. Uh, in her own sense of, of self and agency, uh, which is uh, a very commanding part of uh, the Abby character as in the hands of Frances McDormand's great performance. So uh, it's interesting to hear Frances McDormand mention that. Also, she mentions uh, her own self-acknowledged inexperience with things like reading the script. Uh, there's a really lovely way in she, when she reads the script, how the script oftentimes mentions uh, things from uh, point of view or POV and those were written out in in uh, uh, all capital letters P capital P capital O capital V um, and uh, uh, then she mentions how she she when she was reading it she she thought who is Pav what's Pav who is Pav and so that's her own anecdote to uh, illustrate uh, to us how uh, she was very inexperienced even with reading scripts f for feature films and so that's also a very I think lovely and, and warm uh, comment here and then also she talks too about uh, the importance of, of the performance and listening showcasing listening which I think is really key and really lovely and how she believes that the film is created in the editing and one of the great things about the Coen brothers and working with them is they, they are already editing the film even as they write the film, which is, I think, a really wonderful way of pacing. It reminds me a little bit about how Alfred Hitchcock was described as as, uh, as creating a film almost uh, 
editing it in his mind as he's uh, preparing it uh, pre, uh, pre-production. So I thought that was really interesting as well. Um, and also she acknowledges her uh, professional and personal relationship with the Cohen brothers and specifically uh, between herself and Joel Cohen um, and how this is uh, one of the most important uh, relationships. Uh, and then she ends with a really interesting anecdote about crawling under the table. Uh, and so I'll leave it at that for those who have not yet seen this. But just uh, overall, this is really great uh, interview with Francis McDormand. Again, approximately 25 minutes. But that's not all because we also get the M. Emmett Walsh uh, interview. This is approximately 16 minutes and it's described here as Joel and Ethan Cohen wrote Blood Simple with actor M. Emmett Walsh in mind for the role of private detective Lauren Visser after seeing his performance as a parole officer in 1978's Straight Time. In this interview recorded for the Criterion Collection in June 2016, Walsh looks back on his experiences with the first-time filmmakers, including his insistence that he be paid in cash. Okay, so um, this is a really, really cool uh, interview. M. Emmett Walsh is so, he's so um, unabashedly and unashamedly M. Emmett Walsh. There is this great, he was described by uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen in some of the earlier supplements as being this lovable, avuncular curmudgeon. And you really get that in this interview. And I mean that in the, uh, the uh, complimentarily so great. And it's, there's a, um, uh, there's an almost an, uh, uh, it's a great uh, just directness. And, and almost like uh, uh, don't give an F type of feel to, which I, again, I love. I really, really love. And uh, very honest, very direct. Uh, and he, this is uh, revealed in some of the anecdotes. It's mentioned here about how he insisted on being paid in cash, not checks, um, because he didn't know who these people were. And uh, he, uh, and so uh, he just wanted to be sure he got paid. And so sometimes there's, re- there's some scenes where he, and he kind of, almost uh, jokingly says he regrets being paid in cash because he got paid in so many bills. It was almost hard to keep track of all the bills. But um, although it is still a low-budget film, so that was an interesting, funny anecdote as well. Plus, also, he mentions uh, some of the inspirations. I love how he, he makes reference to Sidney Greenstreet. And this is such a great uh, reference, too, because when he mentions that, uh, when I first saw this interview some years back, and he I first heard this mentioning of Sidney Greenstreet by M. Emmett Walsh in this interview, I didn't realize until I heard that reference that, oh yes, of course, Sidney Greenstreet, M. Emmett Walsh, the private detective in Blood Symbol, this is very much like a an homage or reference to the Maltese Falcon. That's brilliant, perfect, perfect. And yes, yes, the the uh, uh, the, the, the wonderful uh, hat and suit of uh, the Visser character, the private detective character, and uh, uh, that type of image uh, of the Sydney Green Street, <coughs> it's just brilliant, perfect, perfect, and so just like that, this is uh, even creating the the bonds of uh, of this film and film noir and uh, classical Hollywood as well as the, the rugged independent spirit. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, um, and. Uh, there are other things, too, that he mentions, Emmett Walsh, about how uh, working with the Coen brothers, uh, he did work um, a little bit more in, in another film, but uh, uh, how the Coen brothers uh, have their, uh, their the way in which they like to work with a certain type or certain look of an actor. Uh, in their in the roles, either if it's a uh, lead role or maybe supporting role, etc. And so uh, he acknowledges how uh, maybe he his character and his performance and his uh, uh, the Coen Brothers asking M. M. Walsh to be a part of this film was very much a pioneering. Uh, sp- part of the Coen Brothers' uh, aesthetic and working with actors. So he acknowledges that as well. And I think he's very right, because uh, M. N. Walsh's performance here is, is one of the great ones. And it's it's in the pantheon of great characters that we will see, uh, well, we've seen in Brut Simple and we'll see elsewhere in Coen Brothers' films. So uh, the M. M. Walsh uh, interview, 16 minutes, is also made available here. So please check it out if you can. It's really great. And then that's not all, because then we have sound and music, which is described as this. Composer Carter Burwell and sound editor Skip uh, uh, Leavesay uh, um, is um, uh, excuse me uh, began working uh, with the Coen Brothers on Blood Simple, and they've all continued to collaborate ever since. In this conversation recorded for the Criterion Collection in May 2016, they reflect on their early work together and discuss the Coen Brothers' approach to music and sound design. Um, so. 
um, yes, we have the great, uh, let's see here, excuse me here. Yes, we have the uh, the two of them, uh, Carl Burwell and Skip uh, Leavese, uh, sitting in the same room together, and uh, we have the uh, the great uh, sort of interaction between them and talking about uh, how they worked together for the first time, uh, how they. Uh, uh, were uh, trying to uh, find quirky aspects of the sound design and uh, Carter Burwell also mentions again another reference to Alfred Hitchcock this time the film The Birds and um, uh, uh, Bernard Herrmann and how a lot of the the sound design and the music in that film The Birds was very much about the soundscape and and so that was a kind of inspiration uh, for uh, his work and also the sound design work here to to integrate uh, music in a way that's almost like part of the soundscape and so uh, that I think uh, is uh, establishing mood and atmosphere and almost a creepiness uh, that is very apropos so that those details I think are really great as well um, and uh, they do mention here uh, the piano instrumentation uh, that was very much uh, uh, very melodic very melancholy very sad very soft, which is, uh, and how that was uh, ins uh, the inspiration for that, or sort of almost the off the cuff nature of that in a manner, so it led to some really great, great uh, uh, moments of uh, musical passage in this film. And then also, again, uh, speaking of the sound design, uh, there are little quirky details that I think add uh, and enhance and uh, aspects of the layering. Uh, the bug zapper, I think, is an, another thing I mentioned earlier in the in the discussion here. That's such a quirky detail that works so right. It's so perfect. Uh, it's that that um, even that element of death that's in the air and it's in the sound as well as just being a slight distraction, something that's just off in the distance, but it's still very close. So this nature of the uh, the molding and the crafting of the sound design. Uh, and, the, and what are referred to here uh, by the two of them, Texas Sounds, which I think is uh, so great. And then also working with the Coen brothers, their collaboration and, and, and the, uh, the wonderful uh, inviting, invigorating or professional experience that they've had here. So uh, this is a great discussion. Once again, this is approximately 24 minutes, so please check this out if you can. And then last but not least, we have the trailers. And so we have three trailers. First is the fundraising trailer and then the original theatrical trailer and the re-release trailer. So these are the, the first one, the fundraising trailer was mentioned in some of the earlier supplements about how uh, the Coen brothers, before they made the film, they needed to raise money. And so they, they, they rented a camera and I think they mentioned how they, they could get extra days on the, the rental of the camera uh, if they rented over like a, a holiday weekend or President's Day weekend or something. So they ended up getting a couple extra days of shooting, which is really cool. But according to, I think, uh, Joel Cohen. But, uh, uh, so anyway, they, they got a camera and they shot essentially was a trailer before they made the film but a lot of the scenes are things that we will later see in the film itself uh, especially including a scene involving uh, bullet holes through a wall and light shining through the bullet holes and so that that becomes a very iconic moment of uh, the film which is ultimately blood symbol but we get a little bit of a, a teaser uh, uh, almost a pre-visualization kind of thing in the fundraising trailer so it's interesting to see uh, what that was, because this was also something that they needed to show potential investors in order to be able to get them to be convinced to give money to them so they could end up making their films. So that's interesting. So we have the fundraising trailer. Then we have the original theatrical trailer, which is also a very cool treat. And then the re-release trailer, which is also very cool. So uh, the three trailers are included here as part of this package for the re-release of Blood Simple. Again, 2024 re-emergence of this, uh, mirroring what we got in the earlier 2016 release. But that's okay. That's cool because what we had before is, uh, was great, including that uh, that scene select commentary uh, with the, uh, the telestrator pens. Uh, so that was really cool. I suppose um, if I could say... You know, a, um, a lot of times with Coen Brothers films, and in particular with a number of Coen Brothers films that have been released by Criterion, sometimes we might get certain edits or, or sometimes, sometimes maybe I should take a step back. Uh, Blood Simple, I understand, um, you know, was released uh, over the years uh, in slightly different running times. Um, maybe at the end of the day, the difference is quite negligible. And uh, but we do get. I think there was a different, slightly longer version 
that had been made available upon its initial release back in the early 80s. Uh, and so, uh, but I understand we get uh, a version that is the 95 minute version, at least it has it mentioned here. So it would be interesting to get a maybe it would have been interesting to get some supplement or an idea um, if we maybe got a different version as well or, or maybe not a different version but maybe a discussion about uh, what the differences in the editing was in terms of the various release versions that might have existed for purposes of this film Blood Simple. Now I for one uh, in my own personal experience of Blood Simple uh, am not experienced enough to know the specific differences uh, of these but I, I just know based on what I've read um, uh, uh, very generally so uh, therefore from my experience it would have been really cool to have had maybe even a brief explanation as to how this film has been molded even slightly over the years as is, as this has been released and re-released and re-really released but um, I think at the end of the day um, uh, you know we still get uh, a bunch of great supplements that uh, were carried over from the earlier 2016 release. So uh, well done for being able to do this. This is one really, really fun time uh, in terms of the, uh, the behind the scenes and the anecdotes that are shared here. And then now let us turn our attention to just the, uh, well, not just, a very important aspect of this, which is the, uh, the overall uh, packaging presentation and also the, the booklet or the leaflet or the fold that I should mention. Um, so again, I've mentioned many times before, but let me say it again. Uh, this new re-release of 2024 is mirroring a lot of what we saw in the earlier 2016 release all the way down to the great uh, cover design, uh, both in terms of the front and the back. All right here, so let's take a look here. So sorry for the the uh, the, the, the sunlight glare, uh, but I'll do my very best here. I hope you can forgive me. So uh, there's a lot of carryover here. Um, and I should point out too that uh, the, um, the disc here uh, looks like this from the earlier Blu-ray release. Uh, so there is a uh, um, an interesting uh, design on the disc here for that Blu-ray. And when I open up the uh, the newer release, we have the two discs here. Um, sorry, the, the booklet I've removed um, uh, for purposes of uh, today's discussion. But uh, we have the disc, the two discs in the stacked format here. Uh, the 4K disc looks like the earlier Blu-ray disc. So you can see, uh, can you see that? The 4K disc, which is uh, the, the one that's most visible on this release, it's uh, the same design as the Blu-ray disc from the earlier uh, 2016 release and then when I remove the 4k disc from the stacked system uh, we can see uh, the the new blu-ray disc has a different design or different image on it uh, than the blu-ray disc from the 2016 release so that's interesting uh, interesting detail so uh, I like it when Criterion puts images on the discs uh, which I think is really cool uh, but going back to uh, the uh, the the release here I've pulled out the leaflet or the foldout from this uh, 2024 re-release and this is uh, mirroring what we got in the earlier blu-ray which is also the foldout uh, and it, it it goes in like this I should point out too that uh, you might have seen that there was an image available on the left hand side of the uh, the the plastic casing the interior of the plastic casing for the 2024 4k UHD plus blu-ray release uh, and the image is the same as what we got in the earlier 2016 release when the booklet or the the foldout is removed so that's very cool. Um, then speaking of the foldout, uh, which again is mirroring um, uh, what we got in the earlier uh, release. It is a foldout, which I'm not a big fan of. Uh, uh, I wish it was the staple booklet, and I always believe that. But uh, we do get again, which is what we had before, the Nathaniel Rich essay, which is called Down Here, You're On Your Own. And uh, there is uh, some, there's a lot of great references here uh, that Nathaniel Rich makes in this essay. Again, it was part of the 2016 release, but it's, I'm glad it's part of this year again because it's it's so rich and it's there's some um, uh, uh, points that are made references to uh, uh, film noir of the 1930s and 1940s, uh, uh, the sort of uh, hard-boiled uh, American crime literature. Uh, uh, Jim Thompson, uh, James Elroy is also mentioned as well, uh, and as well as the uh, the layering in terms of the context of the Coen Brothers uh, filmography, which is really important, and how it, it really fits into the Coen Brothers sensibilities, uh, 80s work, the low budget nature of it also allows for a kind of a freedom and scope, which is uh, very boundless and filled with a lot of energy. So it's very much a, a Coen Brothers, or apropos Coen Brothers work. Um, and then also just the, 
uh, how it, I think it, it uh, mirrors a lot of the things we will see in other Coen Brothers uh, films. For those who know, there's references here uh, to other later works, uh, such as, uh, I think, very notably, uh, No Country for Old Men, which is a number of years after the fact of making Blood Simple, but there are a lot of parallels uh, between the two films. Uh, so uh, very cool indeed as well as a kind of tradition of uh, 1980s film noir that emerged uh, as well uh, in the cinema scene at the time so this is also seen as maybe part of that that movement uh, again American uh, cinema both Hollywood and also independent which I really like as well so it, it, it has a type of timeliness which is also very apropos so for these and other reasons the Nathaniel Rich essay is uh, definitely worth checking out and I'm glad it's uh, made available again uh, for purposes of this re-release so but much like any other essay from Criterion my strong strong recommendation is to uh, watch the film first and then you can uh, read the great essay again from uh, Nathaniel Rich so that is being made available again for uh, this Criterion re-release of this great film, which is Blood Simple. So, uh, my dear, dear friends, Blood Simple is uh, once again being made available again in this alternative version. Uh, if you have the Blu-ray, uh, ch maybe you already are very satisfied with the Blu-ray already, so uh, maybe you don't need this 4K uh, UHD Plus Blu-ray re-release of this. So if you feel that way, that's totally fine. You're still gonna get a great viewing experience of Blood Simple. But if you are in the neighborhood to get Blood Simple and you haven't gotten around to it yet, uh, or if you are preferring the 4K UHD disc experience, um, and there are certain, say, I mean, it is a film that I think uh, its presentation has, uh, has been made available by Criterion is, I think, very much uh, uh, a fun ride uh, when seen on the 4K UHD disc as well. So uh, if you are in the neighborhood for this film, or if you are uh, seeking out the 4K alternative, then this might be uh, the opportunity, uh, best timing to get this uh, re-release from Criterion. It is a fun ride indeed. I think this is one, this is just so much fun, so scary, and it uh, it's weird and quirky uh, with a wonderful score. I, I, I didn't even mention, I apologize, I didn't mention the great use of music. Uh, that's uh, that part of almost the, the wonderful wry irony. Uh, and the coolness of it as well, I think it's great. So, uh, an overall, just a wonderful total package of, uh, of the greatness that is the Coen Brothers uh, cast and crew of this film, Blood Simple. Okay, my dear friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies, including Blood Simple, including uh, other works of the Coen Brothers, including other films in the Criterion Collection, and beyond. So until the next video, my dear, dear friends, stay strong, stay safe, and cheers. Cheers.